out all throughout the week. This, this ministry going on all during the week in uh, this church, and you're a part of that. We can only do that, I believe, because of the faithfulness of all the people that are involved. One of the rewards of faithfulness for you and for myself and that the Lord promised, he said that if we're faithful with what he has given to us, that he will give us more. He'll give you more. It's not wrong to want more. It's not want, wrong to want to grow. I think there's something wrong if you don't want to grow, you know, because everybody wants to kind of grow and learn. And if you don't, then maybe you have to kind of look at why you wouldn't want to grow and learn and get a little bit better. But I believe that's a desire that's inside of all of us. And then also the Lord commanded that. His first command was to multiply, to increase, to subdue, to take dominion. Your purpose in life is not to just kind of show up. Your purpose is to bring increase to his kingdom. Sometimes people think faithfulness is like, yeah, I'm just going to kind of, no, that's not. Faithfulness and loyalty is about bringing increase to his kingdom. Souls, that's what God is zealous for. God is zealous for souls. So as we, and I didn't know these things, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but then when I became a man, I put away childish things. When you became a woman, I'm not saying to the men that you became a woman, but I'm saying, <laughs> when you grew up, right, you put away childish things. You put those things away. So turn to somebody and tell them, I'm grown. I'm grown. I'm putting away childish things. This is one of the things that it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Meat belongs to those who reason of use have learned to discern. We learn to discern, to understand the times that we're in, and we need to know, and we need to understand, yes, God loves us, but also reason and understand and discern and to navigate this world that God has sent us into. This is your Savior, my Savior. He loves me. He adores me. He adores you. But it's not just about that. It's about us then going and growing and subduing and taking dominion and bringing increase. Why? Because there's children that are out there right now. There are children that are in a bad situation that we've been working for diligently for a year to get them into a safe situation. We don't know them yet, but there is a Rob. There is a, a Justin. There is a Huli. There is an Angel. There is so, there's one of you in that, a bad situation. This is what I think of. This is what the Lord thinks of. We're preparing a place for them even before we meet them as a church. That was what was why Integrity House was formed, because it was a need. People were in bad situations, and that, that's what the purpose was for. That's why we have a church. Not, we don't have a church today because your pastor felt like he had nothing to do. No, it was a reason, there's a purpose, there's a responsibility that the Lord puts upon his people to advance his kingdom. Why am I saying this this morning? Because the Lord wants me to. The Lord wants me to instill a family value of his into this body. And that family value is loyalty. We live in a disloyal world where people don't know what loyalty is. They don't know what faithfulness is. They haven't learned it yet. Jesus says in his word that he's going to send us out like lambs amongst wolves. If we don't know that God, lo well, he's going to, he loves us, yeah, but he's he wants to equip us to handle this world that we're in. Because you are, if you're going to deal with that world, you got to know that they're wolves. You got to know and be able to love them as you're loving them, but not also get devoured by them. Wow, as a body, we need to know and to grow in wisdom and discernment. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, and this is the flagship verse. 
for this message. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that they be found faithful. I've dedicated my life to raising up leaders. And this is one of the things that I say often in leadership meetings and mentoring people. Uh, loyal, with loyalty, loyalty doesn't make you a leader, but without loyalty, you can't be a leader. That's what Jesus says. He makes it real clear. He says, moreover, it is required in a steward, somebody who manages something that's not their own. It's a big mistake to surround yourself with disloyal people, whether it's in your marriage or your family or your business. What you want to be surrounded with is loyal and faithful people. people and this is what loyalty is, faithfulness is. People who are passionate about you, people who love you. You want that. I want that for you. But there. There, to develop a culture of loyalty is what the Lord wants to do in this church. Even more so. I mean, we have it, but even more so. A culture of loyalty is this. Uh, it's going to require these things. It's going to require teaching on loyalty. You know, people don't know. We're not born loyal. We're born disloyal. On our nature, in our flesh, we're rebels. We have all these things in carnality. We have to be taught what loyalty is. We have, to be, we have to have that role model as an example. I know that I did. When I was younger, people had to teach me what loyalty was and uh, how to exhibit that. We also, these are some things that we have to make it easy for disloyal people to exit. You got, you, I want to encourage you, family. I've watched too many people. It is like baby Christians they, you know, with this love walk. It's like they're, they're chasing after their Judas, you know, you, you got to let that person go. Jesus didn't chase after Judas all the time. I know he loved them, but you know what? You got to sometimes let people go, and then maybe one day they'll come back. But uh, I've seen too many young leaders, too many young pastors, too many, as ministers of the gospel, you chase after people that just, well, at the, to the neglect of some of the good people. You know, Jesus, uh, you know, in that example, can you imagine if he spent all of his time with Judas and then he left behind the 11 that had great potential? Uh, we also need to work with the willing. I'm, I'm telling on myself here because there's been so many times where I just was, I wanted it more for people than they wanted it for themselves. And I was working with them and working with them and working with them and working with them and then it just like it was going nowhere. So these are three things that the Lord has made clear. If we want a culture of loyalty, one, we, want, we need to teach on loyalty and what disloyalty is. Two is we need to make it easy for disloyal people to leave. You know, if, they, if that's where they are, sometimes disloyalty is, is like, I'm just not part of your vision. I'm just not part of, uh, you know, I just don't, I'm, not, I'm just not there. Same thing, whether it's a business or, and, and this is, I'm going to go over some terms that even in, in business that people recognize these things. And then you work with the willing. The, these are three examples of amazing loyalty that I see in the Bible. It kind of just like gets my blood boiling. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. It's either get tight. David's about to uh, go through a situation where he's going to face a tremendous opposition. Be careful about who you have around you when you go through great opposition. You want people that are going to be there for you, you know, not the people that kind of desert you like rats on a ship when it's like, you know, in a time of difficulty. And that's why sometimes, I'm not calling anybody anything, but I'm just saying, like, sometimes you, like, look around and everybody's like, yeah, I'm going to be with you in a time of difficulty. I'm like, pew. Well, on the other hand, I've been there, and I'm like, man, I got a whole line, a group of people. I'm like, they're yeah, pastor, whatever, or whoever, you, you know. Have you ever been there where some, you have tremendous support? You're like, all right, now I'm ready. I can charge forward. Well, David had that with Ittai the Gittite. This guy wasn't even born as a, as a Jew. He wasn't even born into the tribe of Judah. He was just a foreigner. He comes to David, and he says, in this time of opposition, as the, David's telling him, go, preserve yourself. And Ittai's like, no, I'm not going to take the easy way out. I'm not going to just let myself off the hook from the responsibilities. I'm going to fulfill my commitment. He says, as the Lord lives and as my Lord the king lives, wherever my Lord the king shall be, whether it will be for death or for life, there also will your servant be. Now you wonder why. You can see how David built this amazing kingdom, how God worked so mightily, because he was surrounded by people that were all out for him, all out for the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, you hear something said from Elisha. Elisha did twice the miracles that Elijah did. And I want you to know why. Because he was submitted to Elijah. 
He learned from Elijah. God pour, Elijah was able to pour out into Elisha. And then Elisha also not only received what Elijah had, but then he also received what he, he received from the Lord too as well. And Elisha is being told, he tells him three times, he tells Elijah, tells Elisha, don't come with me. This is going to be too difficult of a journey. I don't want you to come with me. And Elisha answers him three times the same way. He says this to Elijah, please stay here. This is Elijah speaking to Elisha. For the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. This is going to be a rough road, he's saying. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. We live in a world where people are, they're only with you as long as they're getting something. You know, they're not with you in times of difficulty. Man, you got to be careful about a crew like that. You know, you want a tribe of people that are going to be with you in times of difficulty and stand with you. And they're going to they're labor with you. We say this in the staff meetings all the time. What we want are we want our loyal, faithful, hardworking people that represent the ministry well. That's what we're looking for. That's what you deserve. You deserve that because this ministry has been founded by your blood, sweat, and tears, your efforts, your sacrifices. I love what Ruth said, too, to Naomi. Naomi was, you know, her sons had died. She's a widow. She's a foreigner in a foreign land. Ruth could have just been like, well, you know what? And it's almost like understandable situations. It's like, yeah, you know, our time, our season has ended. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that one before. Oh, hey, I know something better came along. That's okay. Go take it. You know, that's the way it is. But Ruth says this to Naomi. Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For wherever you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do to me also, if anything but death departs me from you. See that tremendous loyalty that was there? I was like, wow, that's such an admirable quality. You know, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning. I want to talk to you about one, being a loyal, faithful servant unto the Lord, allegiance to him, because it's going to be challenged. There are some things in the world, and I don't want to get into them all, X, Y, X, X. It's X, X is a female. That's just bottom line. You know, I'm going to just put some of the, people are going to come in and they call, you know, they're going to say to, to us that we need to, do, we need to bend to their feelings and the way that they feel. And that's not true. There's no bending with the word of God. We're going to, we're going to stand. And you know what? It, it says, does say in the scriptures that in the end times, that people are going to persecute you. They're going to call evil good and good evil. This is what the Lord, yes, and we're, we, we as a body of believers have to get past, the, I need the Lord to know, I need to know that he loves, yes, he loves you, he loves you, but he's also raising up a champion, he's raising up warriors for Jesus Christ, he's raising up uh, people to go out into the world to take dominion, to be fruitful, to increase, to handle responsibility. We live in a world that's trying to avoid responsibility and look for easy they think that that's what the purpose of the gospel is, to provide an easy life for you. No, that's not the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel is that we would deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. That's what he's looking for. There are a lot of people in the world that, you know, that they think that the gospel is about making easy life for them. No, it's not about that. It's about us handling our business and being able to help somebody else with their business. So it says in 2 Samuel 18... As we get into the story this morning, I'm going to talk to you about Joab. People have talked about Joab. Was Joab a loyal person? Was Joab a person who was disloyal? I want you to know Joab was a person that was loyal at one time. But in the end, he was disloyal. See, loyalty is something that has to consistently, and faith, faithfulness isn't just because I did it a couple times. you got to keep doing it. You don't have a faithful husband because a couple times he's endured temptation and then, then he cheated on you later on. No, that's not faithfulness. Faithfulness is all the way through, every time, every instance, every situation. That's what faithfulness is. So in 2 Samuel chapter 18, we see this man, Joab. And was he skilled? Yeah. Was he talented? Yes. Was he, was he a warrior? Yes, Absolutely. But he allowed some things, and I want to go over, I want you to know, as a pastor for many years, I've learned to identify the stages of disloyalty. 
So in 2 Samuel 18, it says this. And Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. And his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. So Absalom was somebody who had this like wonderful hair. And it was like they, somebody who had actually weighed it. It was a few pounds. And what that was is a symbol of his pride. So what happened to Absalom is, is that his pride got him caught up. And this is what the Lord said to me is, is that pride will get you caught up. Pride is, pride is a disease that gets everybody sick but the person that has it. Pride is the beginning, it says, of a person's end. It says, pride cometh before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. So pride uh, is something that will get people caught up. But the scriptures say for us to say small in our own eyes. That's, uh, uh, that's antithetical to the world. The world tells you, you got to sell yourself. You got, but, the, but the Lord is saying to us is that we need to stay small in our own. What does that mean? Do I need to think I'm less than? No. What we need to do is, is we need to think greatly of God. We need to think greatly of other people and the plans and the purposes that God has given to us and entrusted us with. The scriptures say God exalts the humble, but he resists the proud. That's a powerful verse there. That's a powerful verse because there have been times when I was younger, especially, it's like, I'm like, why am I encountering so much resistance? Well, it's because I was a prideful little thing. And I wasn't listening to the counsel of the people that went before me and they were trying to sow into me. So, but then, then, there were, then through those difficulties, I learned to be humble. People taught me. People taught me to be loyal. People taught me. The scriptures taught me to. So God will resist the proud, but he will exalt the humble. I believe humility attracts God's favor, his power, and his grace. It's right there in the scripture. If you will humble yourself before God, if you will humble yourself before those people that are looking to someone to you, if you, because too often people are not willing to listen to counsel or direction from the people that love them the most. And I'm like, why? Why would you not listen to that person? They, they're doing everything that they possibly can to sow into you. And that's the way the Lord is. He's sowing into us. But sometimes we think we know better. We can do it. God, I know that's what your word says, but I got a better plan. And you see how that works out. You saw how it worked out for Lucifer, right? Lucifer, what was his plan? I, 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 I. Be, pride is an eye disease. An I, 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 I. At the center of pride is I. So Lucifer, he went to God, and he was saying, I am this, and I am that. And what they were doing is it was, he was selling himself. We saw in Absalom's life, pride got him destroyed, his destiny. Now, he could have had an amazing, I believe Absalom had an amazing destiny set before him, but he chose to be a rebel instead of being obedient to the Lord and faithful. Uh, Ahithophel also, too, he had a, you know, he, he betrayed David at the time that David needed him the most. Shimei threw rocks at David when Saul told David that he had to leave Shimei, wonderful, faithful person that he was, he took up rocks and threw it against him, uh, David, and all of his faithful people, throwing rocks almost as they were being, uh, as they were exiting. You know, you saw his character. I want to encourage you as, as people that are dealing with the world, be careful about who the people are that they, they uh, they're, maybe they're supportive in during good times, but when there's a difficult time, I like difficult times. I like difficult times because it kind of thins the herd. It prunes the vine. You get to see who, where people really are. Uh, sometimes people are there during the good times. You call them fair weather friends. Well, there's fair weather Christians too as well. So uh, Joab's, in the, and this is what, uh, in the next verse, let's go to verse 10. I call it Joab's independence. Independence sounds good, but it's not. I want you to know that. Independence sounds good, but it's not. Are you, is it good to be independent? Yes, if it's just you. But the moment that you enter into a family, you're not independent anymore. You enter into a marriage, you're not independent no more. It's not about, in the vows, people like sometimes like the, the wedding day, but then 
It was also after the wedding. This is like, we don't live for ourselves anymore, right? I don't get to just make the decisions that I want. I have to take somebody else into consideration. Then it changes when you have children. And when you enter into an organization like a church, you, we have to take one another. We are not independent. We are part of a body. When, so when you're part of what we're becoming is we're pledging a loyalty to other people. So Joab missed that. It's slight, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over some of the things because we need to learn. We need to be able to identify these things in the world, identify them sometimes when they pop up in a church, and also identify them when they pop up in our heart. So in 2 Samuel 18, verse 10, it says, A certain man saw it and told Joab, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said to the man, Who told him? What? You saw him? Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you 10 pieces of silver and a belt. Now, it looks in the natural that Joab is loyal, but in that moment, that's the beginning of his downfall. The beginning of his downfall is that he became independent of his authority. He became, started to just operate away from the organization or against the group. against Because King David gave a very strict command. He said, don't kill Absalom. Don't kill him. He said, don't kill Absalom. Think of being King, da think of being King David. That's your son. Yeah, he did some silly, dumb stuff, but that's still your son. He was, David's probably thinking, well, you know what? I'm going to work with my son. He's acting like a knucklehead, but he's still my son. I'm going to believe for him to repent. Do you ever get to a place as, as parents that you're like, well, I'm going to kill my son and I'm going to be cool with that? No, you don't. You don't get to that place. So Joab was like, oh, I need to do this because this is the problem. Joab thought David was too loyal to a disloyal person. He was questioning the king. He was questioning. He started to think, well, I know better. That's what Satan did. I know better. That's what Judas did. I know better than God. Better than the people that are around me. That, that's, that's sometimes how the spirit of independence operates and works. Is that, yeah, I know better than the people that have been doing this for a long time. I know better. I, I've seen people like that. You know, I'm, I'm not an electrician. As a person that's an a couple of people that are amazing electricians. And they give you, you know, it's almost like this. It's like, well, this has to be done this way. And no, I, I think I can bypass all that. I think I can just rewire all these things and just, it's a lot shorter, a little bit less of a distance. You know, I just, me, I know better than the guy who's been doing it for 20 years, uh, 10 years or whatever it is, has the, you know, certifications in it. So I rewire it. Then I set fire to the house. See, you can bypass other people's wisdom and experience and suffer the consequences of those things. Joab became independent. He started to think, I know better. That's pride. What he needed to learn was maybe a different perspective. So he questioned David's authority and then he began to act independently. And I want, you, I want to share with you that what I consider the stages of disloyalty. First one is, is that somebody becomes independent. Yeah, I know that's what um, Pastor Angel wants, but I'm going to do it my way. I got a better way. Or, you know, I know that's what my husband wants, and he's trying to manage the finance, but you know what? I just want to do this. Well, that becomes independence. You're not operating in unity anymore. The Lord wants uh, us to operate in unity. When there's unity, there's power. All throughout the Bible, when there's unity, there's power. So maybe sometimes we need to slow down a little bit. Maybe we don't know as much as we need to. Well, we got to allow people to get into a place where uh, they, you know, they're, they're in unity. So the second stage is this. It's usually somebody who becomes angry or they're bitter. And then they isolate and withdraw. So you can kind of see that. They get a little sullen. Maybe you've dealt with teenagers before. You know? And I want to say this to you is that we're all just big children. Some people acknowledge it. Some people recognize it. Me, I, I realize that we're all children of God. We're all people. But it's so apparent for me as a teacher. I love teaching. But the, I would see the children. They don't hide anything. They just tell you the way it is. So I learned a lot about human nature from dealing with children. 
Uh, so when some, a child doesn't get what he wants, sometimes they get upset. And then after that comes the passivity. No, this is the third stage. And for us as adults and in the church world, let me give it to you the way it is. They sit at the back of the church. Somebody who used to sit in the front starts sitting at the back. When, they start, when they're sitting in the front and then they sit in the back, I know they're all making their way towards the door, which is the exit. You know, sometimes it's, these are simple things. I'm not saying you should be paranoid. I'm saying, that I'm also like, hey, you know what? I want to be mindful of these things too. Sometimes people are like, oh yeah, they'll share and like, and you know, sometimes they're so supportive. People sometimes can't support you in public because they're tearing your back out in private. I mean, that's just the way, it, that's just the way it is, you know? So be careful when people can't support you in public. Be careful when they can't get you back because you know what, that's usually, that can sometimes be a signal. So these are some things of passivity that I wanted to point out to those people that want to grow and mature. We're, I believe we're past milk. You know, it's okay to, to but we want to navigate. These are the things that we want to navigate. I, I try to be careful as I'm dealing with the world if somebody's like, well, you know what? I'm all for your vision. I want to do it. But I'm like, they, there's like a, a, a passivity. They kind of drag their feet when I'm asking them to do something. So these are some things in the church world. They start sitting in the back. They stop communicating with you. You get some nonverbal signs of disinterest. If you're sitting in the back today, I'm not picking on you guys. So that whole back row over there. You guys are good. But, you know, what I, you're getting my point? This is like there's a distance. There's an emotional distance from people that were, you know, that were so on fire and close with you. And then the fourth stage, this is before the treachery comes, is that they become critical of you. You know, they, there's all these, they magnify flaws. They, they only see the bad inside of a situation. It's they only see the bad inside of you. Have you ever dealt with people like that? You know, you're like, man... I'm trying to bless you. And all you see is, is me trying to operate against you. I mean, that, that, that's where sometimes people, because Satan stirs up the minds and the hearts of people, the things that they've been through. The, last, the next one is, this uh, is an a wonderful example of loyalty. And this is what I would pray for you. Because people miss this one, but this is a powerful statement. It wasn't through Joab, by the way. It was through a soldier. So in 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 12, but the man said to Joab, so Joab's telling him, he's like, you should have killed Absalom. He's saying that to the soldier. The soldier's like, no. He said, even if I felt in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, this is the soldier saying to Joab, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, for I heard with my own ears that the king said, you should not reach out against the king's son. For in my hearing, you and Abishai and Ittai, for my sake, protect the young man. So the king said, protect my son. And Joab killed him. Look, some people who were unwise would say Joab was loyal. That sucker was straight disloyal. He was operating totally on his own understanding, totally outside of what, of what David had asked for. And he was making it look like loyalty. In verse 13, he says, On the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life, he knew even, he even knew Joab was on his way out. He says this, On the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously against his life and there was nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stand aloof. Meaning like, oh, if I would have did what you wanted me to do, I would have done your dirty work and you would have left me to pay the price. See, we are sent out as lambs to deal with wolves in the world today. The people that we're called to love, to Christ, sometimes they'll hurt you. We have to be wise enough to love them, but not be hurt by them. See, that's, that's what Jesus is saying to you. He's saying, I love you. I, I, you're my son. I want you to be who I was on the face of the earth. I want you to be a redeemer. I want you to set the captives free. Here's what I want to give you a reality of is sometimes people in Christianity think, well, you know, a good Christian, everybody's going to love you. Think you're the best thing since sliced bread. It's not true. If Jesus couldn't get through it with everybody loving him, guess what? You aren't either. We got to be okay with one person's approval, the Father's. 
And I, I for me, as a, as a leader in the body of Christ, I'm always very mindful of this. The second one is, is if I don't have the agreement of the person who is uh, my authority, then I need to check myself. So wives, you need to check yourselves if you don't have your husband's agreement because you may be beginning to operate independently. If you're in a church, well, be careful because this is the way disloyalty sounds. I'm going to give you independence looks like in a church. Well, I, I'm starting a Bible study, and I'm going to use Pastor Angel because I've just, you know, I don't want you to think it's just me. Well, but, but Pastor Angel, you have no authority in this Bible study. This is my own little Bible study. Wow, that's a little bit scary that the person wouldn't want some direction from their spiritual authority. You know, you should want your a spiritual authority because we're part of a group. So in the, a spirit of independence is like, okay, I'm in this, but I'm not really in this. And this is one of the things that I want you to know. And I'm not saying this, but these are things to be, I'm not saying every Bible study is like that, but be mindful. Be mindful of those things because if there's enough of these things, then probably it could be the beginnings of something. So Joab goes on. In verse 14, Joab didn't waste time moving in the king's best interest. Now, Joab was still in his heart. He was like still kind of like for David, but really what he was is for himself. See, because he was associated with David, but, his, but David's agenda really wasn't his agenda. Joab's agenda, he had an agenda that kind of ran concurrent with it. So Joab's moved on David's behalf the way that he wanted to. You know what Joab's real, in my opinion, Joab's real agenda was? Joab's real agenda was is that I love being the general. I love being the general. I don't want to be the king, but I love being the general. So if Absalom gets into position, what's going to happen to my position? So what he did was he, he did his own thing, independent of the spiritual authority, independent. And that's where we live. We live in a world. So he, what he was really doing was trying to take care of his. So in 2 Samuel 18, 14, it says, Joab said, I will not waste time like this with you. He's telling him. He's kind of getting righteously indignant. He really didn't have a leg to stand on because the soldier was being loyal to his king. And he took three javelins in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. Verse 15. And 10 young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and shook him and killed him. The real heroes in this story is the soldier that was loyal to the king and Joab's armor bearers. And I wanted to share with you why. Joab's, uh, the, the, the soldier was loyal to the king's command even when it cost him. Saul lost his kingdom because he leaned on his own understanding trying to please the people instead of being obedient to the Lord. And this is, this is for me. I'm sharing this with for me. There are times where it's going to be, and I know this as a leader. I, I'm with you. I don't want more responsibility, but I, I have to be faithful so that the Lord can give me more responsibility so that we can make a greater impact for his kingdom. But... I'm going to have to be faithful to him to a greater degree because there are people going to, that are going to challenge us as spiritual leaders. And we've in a, we live in a world where the spiritual leaders have sold out. They're, that the Lord is looking for people with enough backbone and they're not going to bend to the world's opinion. And so we're going to have to stand. I'm going to have to stand against popular opinion. I know these days are coming. I want to have a body, a, a family, a group of people around us that you will, you're part of it too. That will be part of the solution, solution, not the problem. So Joab's armor bearer was the second person that's the hero in the story. And these are the three things that I see in Joab's armor bearers. So Joab's armor bearers, as soon as Joab took the spears, they were faithful to their leader. They were faithful to their leader. Joshua was faithful to Moses. And you don't see this in the world anymore. Joshua was faithful to Moses when Moses was making a mistake. Moses was making a mistake not going into the promised land. But Joshua was still faithful to Moses. And you know how God rewarded Joshua? Joshua was the one that went into the promised land. See, I've learned as long as, long as my spiritual authorities or my natural authority, and I'm going to put this in layman's terms too. So if... A boss 
asks me to do something that's against my convictions, I'm getting another job. That's just the way it is. As disciples, if we're working for a company that doesn't align with our beliefs, get another job. You know, that's, it's tough, but that's, we, we won't be a part of something. And there are wonderful disciples that have chosen, hey, I'm not going to work for this company because it doesn't align with my values. I can't cause something to grow that's against my values. Like for me, I wouldn't work at a bar. I wouldn't work at a place that was an abortion clinic. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do certain activities. There are certain things that I just wouldn't, just wouldn't be a part of. Now, depending on where you are, I'm not, I'm not slamming anybody. I'm just saying, but your personal convictions. So if, if, here as, as Christians, if I'm, I say this to people all the time. I'm not everybody's pastor. But if you feel like you can't receive direction from me or you're not a part of the vision, don't act independently of us. I want to, like I said in the second one, I want to help you to be where you're called to be so that you enjoy where you're supposed to be, so that you thrive, so that you flourish because sometimes things just aren't a fit. But if it is, and this is why it's so important, we need unity. We need to keep that unity. So if somebody comes and they're disgruntled, these are the ways that we would handle that. Just like, hey, you know what, go speak to the pastor. Go set up a meeting with him. Don't go to 5 and 10 and 20 people. Uh, speak to one of the pastors that are for integrity homes. Go speak to Pastor Leanne. You know, understand the heart and the reason why. And that's why we have some meetings on Wednesday, uh, on the third Tuesday of every month. Make the time, though. Make the time. This is what sometimes people do, do in the church. And I'm, I'm just, you know, like I said... Just saying the way it is. It's like, yeah, you know what? I, I don't really know what's going on. But when we have a meeting, nobody shows up. And there's no wonder you don't know what's going on because we have a meeting and nobody shows up. Oh, if you really want to know, don't just, because people have left the church because they're like, well, I, I need to be in the know about everything. This is me. I'm switching the role. I don't need to know everything. I need to trust that my pastor's heart is he's handling stuff so that I can handle what I'm handling because we're a team. You know, not everybody's called to be the quarterback. You need the receiver just as much as you need the quarterback, and you need the defenseman, and you need the offensive lineman, you need the keyboardist, you need the singer. Everybody ha working together is, becomes a symphony, but everybody trying to do their own thing becomes a cacophony. It's a horrible noise. So Joab's armor bearers were three things. They were discerning. And this is for, I want to pray for this impartation for us as a body. We need to teach all of it. Am I saying that we don't have loyalty? No. Am I saying that there's going to be revelation and wisdom? Yeah, there is. There's going to be greater understanding and greater impartation. I believe we're going to be prepared for some of the things. And I would have appreciated a teaching like this 20 years ago because it would have I feel like it would have fast-tracked my uh, growth and my, my walk with the Lord. So it says, uh, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Many of you know, as you've trained people, they don't listen in a classroom setting. They just don't. Have you ever trained somebody in a classroom setting and they're like, me, me, me. You know when they listen? When they're actually doing it. When they're actually doing it. When they're in the stuff. When they're in the trenches. So that's what the, the Lord has given to us is like, so by reason of use. So this is, this is going to be very applicable to the spirits of the people that are using and about doing the works of the ministry. There are some people, now I'm not, I'm not asking you to call yourself out, but if it's going anywhere near and out the other and you're thinking about lunch, maybe you need to be a little bit more active. Because it's the reason of use. But now if you're like, man, you know what? That's good stuff. I'm kind of like going through some of these things right now. And it's like, then that's, that's a good sign that you're in the right track. So there's a discernment. There's a recognition. The second one is this is a righteous anger. Do you know what Jesus did at the beginning of his ministry? Jesus. Tim, can you help me out? Jesus cleaned the temple out. What did Jesus do? He walked into the temple. And in, uh, in John chapter 2, verse 15, this doesn't align with some people's view, version of Jesus. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money chambers 
and the cha changers and overturned their tables. He wrecked the house. He came in and set things straight. So he did that at the beginning of the ministry, but see, people don't recognize this. He did that at the end of his ministry too. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, it says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove, all, uh, drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the temples, I mean, the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. What was he upset with? Is that people were, uh, it was usury. They were taking advantage of the people of God. He came in and he, he cleaned house. And this is what the Lord is saying. He's like, I feel like this. And I wanna, don't, I'm, I, I, why are people not upset about the things that upset God? That's a sign of disloyalty, by the way. Why, why are you not angry? Sometimes people are like, oh, you know, we gotta, be, we gotta be loving. No, why are you not angry about the situation that's going on? Why does that not get your blood boiling? Because there were certain things, I believe every man in this, in this sanctuary, if somebody were attacking a woman, uh, they would do what one man did. Like, we were in a situation once where this guy just bolted up right, right in the middle of the night. He ran out of the building, and I was like, what is this guy doing? I didn't even know what was going on. He had heard, he had like super bionic hearing, and he ran across into the school. And what happened was is there was a woman that was being attacked. He wasn't supposed to leave the property. He, was, he wasn't supposed to, he broke all the rules, but he heard. And so he heard this person that was in danger, and he ran, and, he, and because, of his, uh, because of his faithfulness, he was able to protect that woman. And he, I asked him, I was like, man, what, what was going on? He's like, it's just not happening. Give me all of the point of it. He's like, uh, there was like a righteous anger. He, says, he said to me, I got two sisters. You don't know what that does to me. You don't know what. So this is, this is what I believe the second element is of the Joab's armor bearers, is that they got angry about the things that angered the Lord. That's, that's a wonderful quality because here are some things. Somebody was attacking one of our staff one day. I was like, boy, you better chill out because I'm like, that's not, I mean, you can go and straighten some things out, but that, that's family there. That, that, that's not going to happen. That's what I believe we need is we need to continue to cultivate within the body of Christ. That we're not okay with things that are unpleasing to the Lord. Here are some things that are unpleasing to the Lord. And I'm not, I'm not trying to get controversial, but hey, you know what? Uh, there is only one gender. There's only male and there's only female. Don't ask me to say anything else other than that because it's just, honestly, it's just straight stupidity. Now, hey, you might hate me and all of these other things. I'm not trying to please everybody. I'm trying to please the Lord. Uh, if everybody ever asked me to marry somebody, no, it's just not going to happen. There are other things too. It's like what, during the COVID, no, you're not getting to close the church. No, I don't care. No, put me in jail. There are some things worth dying for. I'm just sorry. <laughs> I, I would rather die faithful to the Lord than live as a coward because a coward dies a thousand deaths. So a righteous anger has to be inside of it. No, you're not going to defame the name of the Lord. I remember, this wasn't me. There was a guy as a young, as a young believer. I'm, I'm reading my Bible and there was a man who was a little bit more seasoned than the Lord and uh, somebody was using the Lord's name in vain. They were like, oh, J.C., you know. I didn't think anything of it. But the guy goes, oh, you! Don't use the name of the Lord in vain in this place. And we were a bunch of unsaved people. Everyone was like, and then you know what? Everybody in that workplace, 50 people, nobody used the name of the Lord in vain. Why? Because he had such an honor and a reverence. He changed the atmosphere of where he was. Because he was so loyal to the Lord, he didn't want to hear that. Man, I think that that's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing. So being angry about things that anger the Lord. And I'm not saying losing your temper because he didn't like fly off the handle and threaten the guy. He just said, hey. And then he explained it to him. He's like, I find that offensive. I find that offensive because you know what? Jesus died for me. Now you may not get that and you may live the life that you have. But if you have any respect for me and you have any respect for, he's like, please don't use the name of the Lord in vain. And he explained that to everybody. And now I feel like that's loyalty. That's loyalty to the Lord. The third one is this, is faith in action. 
Be doers of the word and not hearers of the word. James 1.22, deceiving yourselves. So what did the armor bearers see? They saw that Joab didn't finish the job. And what they did is good, faithful armor bearers, they finished the job that Joab had started. The second was that they had a righteous anger about the rebellion that was taking place. They didn't fully understand it, and they weren't wise enough to handle it, but they followed their leader. The third one, because as long as your leader doesn't ask you to sin, the way I was taught is you follow him. You know, there are situations that you shouldn't. I remember as a young leader or a person being raised in the body of Christ, we went to a, a, a community outreach, and everybody was loaded in their pockets off with stuff and candy and things like that. And then they were like, yeah, we're going to bring it back to the church, and we're going to give it to everybody. But the lady told us, don't take anything from the thing, from the warehouse. So these guys were all like, yeah, you know what, you know, loading up, and, you know, it was like 50 pounds of candy. I'm like, what do we need all this candy for? But anyway, that was just like, I just said no. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. The person said, don't do it. I'm not going to do it. So they, got all, they all got mad at me. Well, when we got back to the church to do the work for the community agency, the community agency was like, well, you know, your people came by and they kind of stole stuff. Unintentionally defaming the name of the Lord. So they, they asked for all of us to kind of, you know, and they checked, and I was the only one. And he was like, well, why didn't, why didn't you do anything? Because they told me not to. It's that simple. I'll follow what you asked me to do as long as it doesn't violate my personal convictions and my honesty before the Lord. Anything else, I'm your guy. But if, you, if it's outside of the will of God, don't ask me. Now, I want to say this to you. I got your back in anything that you do as long as it's of the God. I want you to have one another's back as long as it's the things of God. If it's not God, then don't do it. The third is uh, doing something about it. So wisdom, discernment, and action. Now, I want to ask you this morning, because Satan plays whatever, you know. Was this helpful for you this morning? Uh, Praise the Lord. Well, we have a very loyal and a very faithful body. And some of us are learning. Some of us are growing. But if you're never taught, then how can somebody expect you to be loyal and faithful? And the Lord is looking for those people. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, and also verse 23, he says this. He says, to those that were faithful, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Let me read that verse to you. Matthew 25. And this is my dream. My heart, but also this is what gets me going. I want you to get everything that God wants you to have. And not because he wants you to have stuff, but because there's a desperate need for souls. There are are young men that need to be discipled and fathered. There are young women that need to be shown the ways of a virtuous woman. There's a generation of people that are following after people that that are completely lost. There, my heart breaks for him. I would love to save everyone, but I believe God uses an agency, the body of Christ. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, it says, His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant or slave. You were faithful with a few things. So he was faithful with some responsibility, and some of you have been faithful with, with responsibility. You know what you get when you're faithful with responsibility and work? More work and more responsibility. I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So this morning, I, I would ask you, as faithful disciples, don't shy away from responsibility. Don't shy away from increase. I know there's a, there's a temptation for those things. Pledge your allegiance. You know, if this is your church, loyally, faithfully, Dispatch your services unto the Lord and be involved as you can. Some people can't and physically. I know I can't do what I did when I was 20 anymore. Uh, don't, you know, I can't run that way. I'm not asking you if you're in your 60s or your 70s to go to the, to the youth work day. There's some younger people that need to do that. They need to pay their dues. Some of you <laughs> older people, you've been faithful. Let some of the younger people run with some of that stuff and be okay with it. 
We're a multi-generational church, multi-cultural multi, uh, church. So again, but be loyal and faithful to the ministry that God has called you to be a part of. So this morning, I, I would ask, who is it that wants to pledge your allegiance? You may have already pledged your allegiance. Well, you know what? That's what a rededication is. We're rededicating. Let, let's call it that, a rededication to the Lord. Lord, I'm not here just for me, myself, and I. I'm here to advance your kingdom. I'm here to count the cost, to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow you, Lord. I want to be loyal to you, but I also want to be surrounded by loyal people. If you can accept that, I want to ask that you would come to the altar area. If you want to be one of those, I know I am. I think it's important. I know it's important. I learned when I first got married, public displays of affection are important. Sometimes people are like, well, why do we do altar calls? Well, if you can't stand for the Lord now, probably won't later but if we do now it's a great sign that we'll stand for him later we'll worship and I want to pray for you to be surrounded by a spirit of loyalty and a spirit of faithfulness so let's worship if the altar's where you need us meet me there
Father, I thank you, Lord. Yes. I thank you for my brothers and my sisters. If you would, family, if you're at the altar, if you could just put your hand over your heart. We used to do this in the schools, and they don't anymore. But it's a pledge of allegiance. I feel like it should be done. We used to do it every day. I still do it in my personal time with the Lord. I'm asking God for the strength. So if you would, just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I pledge my allegiance to you, the one true God, my Lord and my Savior. Help me to loyally and faithfully dispatch my duties unto you as an act of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I just thank you, Father, for every person, Lord, that pledged their allegiance to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you would empower them to be the loyal and faithful subjects, Lord, that would, that would hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, that when they fulfilled their responsibilities, Lord, they would be able to be entrusted with more because we're not living for our comfort, Lord. We're living for the advancement of your gospel, for the message to get out to the world that there is a God that fiercely loves them, so much so that he would die for them and put them in, put them in a place of blessing as he took their place of punishment so that they could have eternal life. That there's only one way, Lord, to the Father, and that's through your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you would continue to raise up a body of loyal and faithful people, Lord, that are about your kingdom being advanced, not their own personal kingdom, so that we can affect as many souls as possible. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the lives that have been touched, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you would continue to meet every need physically, spiritually, financially, Lord. Those people that are believing for breakthrough, Lord, let them be reminded, Lord, that there is a family that loves them, praying in agreement, Lord, for their breakthrough, for their healing, for their restoration, for the provision, for their answer to prayer, Lord, for their promotion. Lord, we just give you the honor, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for calling us into a body, Lord, and surrounding us with people that are in a body that are so loyal and faithful to you and to one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you guys are going to your seats, I please want to ask you to see Heather. Um, please see Heather, I take a picture. I, I love you guys, so I'm going to get, be real with you. So if you don't give us a picture or let her take a picture, we're going to find a picture. Uh, I'm going to put one there for you. So I'm not even going to say it's going to be you. It might be something else, but we're going to put something there. So please, if you would, see Heather, just take a picture. Thank you. Jesus loves you guys, and so do we.